in five, four, three, two, one. Hola, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, hippies and straights around the world. This is your old friend, Dr. John Konopak, down in Albuquerque, New Mexico, a citizen journalist down here, climbing atop, well, scrambling, in fact, to the very edge of the citizen journalist exchange worldwide hippies soapbox today to bring you, um, well, stop me if you've heard this before. <laughs> There's a poster meme floating around among my crowd on Facebook which features a memorable passage from Aldous Huxley, a book uh, for the number and sagacity of which he was highly and rightly honored. To the effect that there will be in a generation or two a pharmacological method for making people love their servitude. It goes on, but that's the point. I contend that Huxley dreamed too small, and that there is indeed now such an opiate, but that it is not produced by any pharmacy. It's called commercial television, and it doesn't need any additional pharmacological components, just the flickering blue screen. It's quite mesmerizing, you know. And um, the messages, which are called programs and commercials, are crafted for it in such an array of clever and subtle propaganda methods, with such care and attention, and at such expense, at so many levels of awareness, that it is quite impossible to resist them all. I wish it were as simple as giving us all a potion to swig or a cocktail of them. Bring on the soma. <laughs> but it's all done quite simply um, with these glowing screens before which children are stationed from their very first breaths and from which do they now not ever stray too far. A lock, step, grip with all the portable devices made all the easier to exert and uh, more or less contain and less unusual for their presence. It's the pharmalo it is, I think you're right, pharmacological to the extent that it's neurochemical. And if you watch folks, uh, people consulting their iPads and iPhones and etc., they're just as furiously pursuing their fix as any junkie chasing down a needle in a nickel bag. Well, shout the scolds who are now just starting to notice that things are not as rosy as they had been led their whole lives long to believe and cherish. They say, you let it happen. We let it happen. And I, I want to say, no, no, we did not let it happen. That's a filthy canard in a class with free will, if you will. It's exactly the way that rapists can blame their prey for being there to be raped. The you-could-have-stopped-it meme requires us, the victims, to take the blame for what was done to us. Consciously, with forethought and premeditation, and with terrible resolve. I mean, some of you must have watched Mad Men. We've got to understand what we would have had to have prohibited to have prevented this. To do that, we've got to go back about a hundred years for all practical purposes, though the story really begins with the discovery of the masses by sociologists a generation or so earlier, guys with names like Weber and Durkheim. Directly and indirectly, they influenced Sigmund Freud, and Freud changed everything, especially later. Freud had a nephew named Edward Bernays, an American, one of that generation of Americans who were to Wilson what the vanguard intellectuals were to Lenin, and with whom they were all contemporaries, by the way. Bernays took an interest in his uncle's insights about human motivation, sex and death mainly, and he recognized in that insight a clue to controlling the masses, which was a big issue at the time, which were, in fact, quickly and soon burgeoning and clamoring for more influence. But he was also an eclectic reader and a man of letters. He held a European university education and was fluent in several languages, conversant in many fields. Now, I admit at this point I'm starting to speculate just a little bit, but and I haven't done the necessary digging to irrebuttably support the claim I'm about to make, but it seems irresistible and irrefutable to me that Bernays 
saw the connections and implications among Pavlov's work with what we now call operant conditioning. And he would have certainly been fluent in the instrumental ethics of industrial tailorism, what we now call scientific management. And he was already versed in his uncle's Eros and Thanatos understandings. He mumbled a few words, prayed an incantation or two, and in about 1919 he invented public relations an industry which has, in various forms and constellations, controlled the destiny of the planet for now about the last hundred years. We had no more possibility of resisting this onslaught than an ant colony can resist the flooding Mississippi. No, and we didn't try to stop it or prevent it either, but that's another canard. Stop what, I ask you? Prevent what? the most extravagant spree of national consumption in history? There were folks who, pers who foresaw it, I'll admit, Ed Abbey was one, but the appealing was, or the appeal, pardon me, the appeal was overwhelming. It rode, hell, it exploited the euphoria of the U.S. Allied victories in World War II. It was part of the American dream. There were new cars, and they made ritual appearances every spring, and were unveiled at great dramatic moments. And television, how old were you when they sat you down for the first time? If you were born after 1955, I guarantee you, you were a captive of the flickering screen before your first birthday. The genius of the thing is that flickering screen business. Human vision began its evolution in water, where you must pay attention to flickering because that's how most predators look just about the time they're to make you dinner. Our eyes evolved to be perfect receptors for the first motion pictures and now the seemingly ubiquitous and endless permutations of the blinking pixel. It's bloody mesmerizing. Watch a room where there is a, just a TV screen, no image on it, just the screen on. People will keep checking there, checking to make sure they're not missing anything. And don't make the bigger mistake of claiming you're immune either because you're not. Neither am I, of course. And if you think but it, here's the way you can check. If you think there's a difference between Bud and Coors or Nike and Puma, Dodge and Ford, mm, then you've been recruited, brother. And we can talk about it over a beer when I see you at the beach. Pause. <laughs>